Sometimes I think guys like Cecil Payne, you know, Cecil's such a great baritone player. I used to have all his records back in Britain. I think, hey, these guys used to be my heroes. Now they're my friends. We gotta go into Zabar's because okay. we need to get some, some cheese and a little bit of lox and maybe some of that nice cream cheese they have. What do you okay, think? Okay, but let's not buy too many things because you're not gonna be home for the weekend. I came to live in New York at the end of 1965. I'd been to the States before, of course, with Humphrey. Humphrey Littleton for the Newport Jazz Festival in 1959, and I'd always had a hankering to come back. It's filled with no smoked cheese. It's filled with nitrates. Forget it, temporarily. Forget it. Let's get. We have to get some. It's like you make a reputation, be it in Scotland, or Britain, or Europe, and there comes a time you've got to measure it against the best, and that means New York. This is good. This is great. This is a nice one. You leave that out overnight. That's a good one. That's ready now. At first, I thought that every musician in New York City was an absolute killer, dynamite. But pretty soon I discovered that the thing about New York is it's got the worst as well as the best of everything, musicians included. I've been with Woody Herman, Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, Clark Terry, Mingus, the Ellington Band, and of course, one of my all-time greats, Buck Clayton. One, two, three.
Milt Hinton is known as the judge. That says a lot about Milt and a lot about jazz. I mean, history is very important to jazz. And Milt, well, he's had them all and played with most of them, taking wonderful photographs of most of them, too. How did you, I mean, how did you come about your start of your professional career? From Chicago, you... Well, you I saw Al Capone open up this nightclub in Chicago, in Chicago, and now that the theaters are all closed, Al Joseph had made the first sound movie, The Jazz Singer, and all the violin players are losing their jobs because now we don't need violins in theaters anymore. Oh, the see. sound is on the screen. Right. See, yeah. so now, and here I'm just ready, 16, 17 years old, ready to play, get in the band, and there's no work. Uh -huh. And I saw all of my peers go to work for Al Capone at this cotton club he had, and he was paying them $75 a week, which was astronomical That's in those days. That's a lot days. of money, yeah. A lot of money. And, and Al Capone was, a, we looked at him as a Robin Hood. Right. He'd get these, let these guys get cars, and just tell the guy, give him a car. The guy <laughs> have to give you a car. And so yeah. they would be, I'm still delivering newspapers now, and here these, my friends are driving by me with Ford cars with disc wheels, and they would say to me, why don't you get a horn? And so consequently, I said, hey, maybe I better change. And yeah. I thought it was easy, to, since I'm a string player, to change from, from violin to bass. Right. So I stuck up the bass, faking it first, <laughs> good enough to get a job. And sooner or later, so all the bass players got drunk one night, and there was nobody left. They said, well, get the kid. <laughs> yeah. I got a shot at it. I finally got to be very good at bass. You know, I'm pretty good. And like all young people, I wanted to outdo the old guys. So tried to play things, slap the bass, and go go crazy. So yeah. I was getting a lot of work and trying to go to school. And when I got in music history classes, I'd go right to sleep. Yeah. And my teacher, I had a wonderful teacher, a man, man named George Goma Jones, that had studied in the Royal Academy under Coleridge Taylor. Oh, so he had some kind of sympathy feeling for, for black people because Coleridge Taylor was a black master from the Royal Academy. And he, uh, he saw me sleeping in the history classes, and he says, hey, Mr. Hinton, was happening, and I told him I had to work because I had no father. Right. And he said, well, uh, I, how much are you making? I, by that time, I had one job making 40 bucks a week in the theater, 60 bucks a week in the theater, and going from 11 o'clock to 4 in the morning in a nightclub, mm. making $40. So I was making 100 bucks a week. And my teacher says, I don't make 100 bucks a week <laughs> at the <laughs> university, he says. Yes. <laughs> Someone gave me a camera for my birthday, and I'd be with all these wonderful musicians like Chew Bear and Cab Calloway and Doc Cheatham and Ben Webster. I wanted to photograph them. I tried to photograph musicians in their own habitat, right. not like photographers to catch us on the bandstand with our horns up. Yeah. I wanted to catch the guys sleeping the buzz and working in some restaurants where we had to eat with the signs back in those days. It's right. told what, 
what direction we had to go in, in order to get something to eat and that uh -huh. sort of stuff. And I was documenting them just for my own uh, fun. Sometimes the professional photographers weren't, weren't allowed in the studios because it would be clicking and that would disturb the people. But I was already in there with my camera, so right. I had a chance to get some of these shots. And now to look at some of those old guys like Dizzy when he was a young kid and all of these wonderful people and seeing Billy Holiday on the last recording session, those sort of things, uh, become like a milestone. The Savoy Ballroom was just up the street here. The Savoy Ballroom, yes, was uh, up the street, two blocks. Yeah. So that's, uh, these days are long gone, though. I mean, uh, now... I, I think they'll come back. You do? Yeah, I, I, I predict... I, I predict... Hey, that's hey, Melvin. Melvin. Hey, how you feeling, boy? Right, how you doing today? All right, this young man yeah. uh, happens to be one of the elect licensed electricians in the city of New York, Black, that is. And I'm proud of him for that reason. But other than that, you know what I mean? He's all, he's a nice fellow. Uh -huh. <laughs> we do the Empire State Building, the airports, 
candidate. What we have to do, we have to re How are you doing, my dear? All right, madam. So what we have to do, yeah. we have to restructure this entire community and create a different atmosphere, you see? Well, Harlem has such a rich history of jazz. It has, a, yes, it has and a rich history. And, and all kinds of things. But the thing about it is, hi, dear. The, things, the thing about the history is, history is not always true to its core. From the 20s on, you had changes. You had different ideas. You see, but what happened was, a lot of people who made an effort to try to play that kind of music, that new kind of music, couldn't play it. Yeah. So a lot of the old style music was lost. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays, uh, there isn't any music at all, so... Well, I'm here. I'm, I'm 80 years of age, and I've been playing 65 years. Well, I'm here, and I'm 38, and I've been playing for 18 years. Well, I, I, I question your, your, your verbiage, your amount of 18 years. And then you may be 18 years, or you may not be. Now, which is, is it? <laughs> but then we're walking in your neighborhood now, so I no, don't no, no, behave no, myself. No, 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 you, no. You've got absolute protection from me as an honorary member of the New York City Police Department. And then I have uh, Mel Brown here, who has studied judo and all that business. And we yeah. will. He will uh, attest to the fact. He'll take care of us, will he? And I don't know. He, if, if things get too tough, he'll run. <laughs> Thank you. 
one night I was riding home in the car and I heard the saxophone player playing in a sentimental mood and I just loved it. I was very impressed with Ralph Moore and I started asking about Ralph Moore and uh, much to my surprise, I found out that uh, the first 15 years of his life he spent in London. He lived in Brixton. Your mother, I believe, is a dancer. Yes, she's still in Brixton. She danced in London or where was she? She danced in London, she danced across Europe. Uh, she never came to the States, but uh, she did a lot of dancing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, she was uh, given a shot in the chorus line. She actually took uh, Josephine Dance Place, who, who was actually Josephine Baker. I think that was her stage name. So how did you go about uh, starting to hear some jazz out there? My mother, being in the business, mm -hmm. uh, she knew a lot of musicians and, oh, yeah. and uh, dancers and entertainers and so on yeah. and so forth. And she always had a lot of music around. And uh, I, I would have to say that she was my first uh, so you actually had all that jazz in London to start with? Sure. And then what made you decide to, uh, to come to America? Well, my father's American. He's from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh -huh. And you, uh, when you came to America, you didn't go to St. Louis, though, did you? No, well, he, was, he was in the Air Force, OK? So he, that's how he came to be stationed in London when he met my mother. I see. Yeah. But um, he was stationed out in California at Vandenberg Air Force Base at the time that I came over to the States. So I landed in California. So how did you feel when you came to California and you discovered there wasn't any jazz? Totally confused. Yes, I bet. No, it was actually a big step, I mean, yeah. in a lot of ways, because I was very young. Right. And I left my mother, and so it was a big adjustment uh -huh. period so, for me. So how did you cope with it? What did you do? Uh, I just kept the horn in my mouth, basically. Yeah. And just, you know, I had records around. I mean, I could still get in touch with the music, and I went through school and, you know, adapted as best I could. And uh, as soon as I got old enough and I had eyes, I went looking for the music. And then what? You came to New York? I came to New York about 1980, 81, yes. in the winter time. So what did you think? New York I City. It. I tried to come here once or twice before, you know. Yeah. I, I, A lot of people come to New York City and take one look and run, you know. Well, I've, I've probably been accused of being one track by many people now. and. and when I came here, I really only saw the music. You yes. know, it was it was what brought me here, and it's. I refuse to see anything else. I mean, there's there's a lot of bad things that you could see in New York, you know. But I was just looking to get into the music, and I guess I was one tracked enough to. Well, that happens to me too. I mean, I, there's there's several times I thought, well, you know, I've had enough of this. I'm going back to Scotland, and I, I've actually done it a couple of times, and and I get over there, and I'm over there three or four weeks, and I think I. You know, it's great here, it's peaceful, nobody's robbing me and I can walk down the street. Yeah. The only thing I would miss about New York are the New York musicians, and that's what I miss most when I go away from New York, and I guess I can relate to that totally.
I always love to come back to Loch Gelly, my hometown in Scotland. I always come direct from New York to Loch Gelly, so it's always a, a tremendous shock to come back. But then after I've been in Loch Gelly a half hour, I start to sort of uh, calm down and, and realize that uh, this, is my, this is my Brigadoon, because Loch Gelly is exactly the same as it was when I was a kid. I just love it. And uh, I'd love to come back to Loch Gelly because it never changes. That's dead on again. Two good shots in a row you've done. Right. I was trying to remember which course it was where we played Seven Hours in Thick Fog. Do you remember? Yeah. That was the best fog of all. Yeah. Well, I that was a couple of good shots. Yeah, I thought I might have caught the edge of that bunker, but uh, all is well. Yeah, I think oh, I'm I away. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm away. I think I can get this putt too. <laughs> Humphrey? Do your worst. I got to know Humphrey Littleton around the early 50s. I'd been playing the, the baritone off and on, but that's when I really started playing the baritone on a regular basis, and I'm very glad of, of the opportunity from Humphrey, and Humphrey and I have been like brothers ever since. Is that a gimme? Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. Well, that's fairly generous. <laughs> Notice the Jack Nicklaus knees, don't you? Benny Goodman used to play clarinet like <laughs> that, didn't he? Look out. So if you get three, you buy the drinks. Now it's going off to the left. Oh, that's... Well, right. I think I can give you that. Humphrey, uh, when I was putting my notice in with Joe Loss, he was absolutely astounded when I, when I said I wanted to leave his band because he said, nobody leaves my band until they have their own business. <laughs> so I could have been safely ensconced in a small boarding house in Bournemouth, you know. Instead right of now. which, you went on into my band. That's right. I went with Jack Parnell. So, after Jack Parnell. And then straight into your band. So I have to tell you, Joe, to remind you that you had something of a reputation as the scourge of band leaders when, by the time you got to my band. Really? And you didn't smile at me. We used to play the, at uh, 100 Oxford Street about twice weekly. And I remember it was a fortnight before you smiled at me. <laughs> and I discovered afterwards you were trying to suss out whether I was a band leader or just the leader of the band. I can remember, I don't know whether you can, I can remember the exact spot, if it still exists, in the bar at Coventry Hippodrome, where you joined the band finally. It was the end of your, about a month you did with the band. And you were sitting there saying, oh, I've had a wonderful time. And I was sitting there saying, oh, it's been great, Joe. And then we, I was going up to the bar, and then you were going up to the bar, and we'd come back. And it gradually worked around. I said, uh, do, you, uh, do you play the baritone saxophone still? And you said to me, I have just discovered in, in talking to you 10 minutes ago that it wasn't true. <laughs> but you said to me, yeah, yeah, that's my main instrument. You know, I was trying to envision some way where I could join the band, because I wanted to be with the band. So. Uh... Yeah. So that's how I had an eight-piece band. I would have played the bagpipes. <laughs> I don't think the, our public was ready for the bagpipes. Right. Let's see. Humph, one of the great things about the band was when, you know, when the Americans started appearing and uh, playing with us. That was the exciting thing about those times, I yes. think, really, because you were you, you had idols who you'd uh, listen to on record for years, yes. and suddenly they were standing next to you on the bandstand. <laughs> lucky with Buck because a lot of those guys who came over used to do their set 20 minute spot. They'd have a backing band and they'd say this is what I do. They'd rehearse their big numbers and all that. 
But uh, as you know, Buck walked in and, and uh, he was a member of the band. close to Humphrey, uh, and Humphrey loved you and really uh, thought sure. the world of you. I love Humphrey, too. Uh, everything Humphrey did, I'd try to retaliate. Yes, I remember those things. And we used to pull tricks on each other. We call them wrestler's tricks, yeah. remember? Oh, yeah. Where the wrestler presumed to be out of, you know, he knocked out. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he comes back to life and makes a stop in recovery. Yeah. So I do that to Humphrey and he do it to me. And I well, enjoyed it. I went to one session that you played. Uh, I think it was at the Roosevelt Grill. You were playing there. That was kind of like a a big jam session kind of right. thing. And how soon after that was it that you actually stopped playing? And how how did you come about? I stopped playing in '69. I think I had all my life it had I hypertension uh -huh. and didn't know it, I see. you see. And uh, my pressure was so high for years until yeah. I went and had it checked. And the doctor said, you, you, uh, he said, Mr. Clayton, you should stop playing right tonight and go rest. Don't oh, play yeah. anymore. Then I started having trouble with my lips and everything. So to make a long story short, I finally had to stop playing because the doctor had made 32 stitches under my lip. Oh, right I see. So when I put the trumpet up there, it would hurt. And, uh -huh. and, and I'd get drunk and it still would hurt. You get so drunk, you don't know whether it hurts or not. Right. And it still hurt. So yeah. I just decided to stop. And I'm glad now that I had to make the change from being a side trumpet player right. to a composer and arranger. Because if I hadn't, uh, I'd still, I was selling advertisements for magazines and yeah. walking up and down Fifth Avenue, Third Avenue. I can't imagine you doing that. I did it in yes. the rain. I'll never forget. And I had a terrible boss. Yeah. And so I'm glad, looking back at it now, I'm glad it all happened. Because right. right now, I'd rather be a composer and arranger. Some people, before they make an arrangement, they sit down and make the sketch for the whole thing, right all the way from beginning to end. Yes. But I don't do that. I, I like to make it a little at a time. I, I do eight bars, and then I do another eight bars when I feel like it. But 
actually, uh, I can be asleep and, and have a dream about some kind of a melody, and I get up and write it down. Yes. And then, because I used to wouldn't write it down, I'd, right. I'd just dream it, keep dreaming and forget it. And lose it. Yeah. And when I wake up the next morning, I don't have it. Yeah. But what I do now, even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I get up, make a sketch of it. Yes. Go back to sleep and then wake up the next morning yeah. and make the arrangement.
Sanjo Temperley turns back the